there's a lot of design constraints that really can impact the the product. You know, they care. They meaning the uh, state historic preservation office, you know, statewide, and then the National Park Service. There's a set of objective standards that you might not want to do. You know, you want to change your flooring and they say no. You want to do drywall and they say, hey, you need plaster or vice versa. Too bad. You got to do it. They don't want you to add this lighting here and they say too bad. You want to put a window here to make the ambiance in the restaurant better? Too bad. You can't do it. So I think that's by far and away the biggest problem is making sure your vision for what you're trying to create jives with what they say you can do. Because if, you know, you can just not do it, but then you lose all the tax credits. Hey, Zach Kupperman, great to see you on the podcast. Thanks for joining. Thank you for having me, Jake. So you have an incredible portfolio and you're based in New Orleans. I've been to some of your properties. They're very impressive, but you got into real estate in a little bit of a roundabout way. And a lot of people often check in with me and they're doing something else, but they want to break into real estate and you've actually done it. So I think a really cool place to start would be to tell us how you transitioned into real estate. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up born and raised in New Orleans. <clears throat> I had moved away uh, pre-Katrina. And when Katrina hit, I felt a kind of a personal pull to return to the city. Um, I had always been interested in real estate, um, but I, I went and got a, a law degree, went to Tulane and uh, practiced law for a while, doing real estate and corporate and finance work. Uh, in the city, it was post Katrina, so it was a lot of rebuilding work. We did a lot of develop representation of developers and and lenders, and so I, I kind of had that side of it. But the the pull to go into business was was uh, was more, and and I um, you know I liked practicing law, but I I really just loved real estate and wanted to do it, and uh, didn't quite know how to get there. I ended up leaving law. I started a company called Dinner Lab, which was a membership-based social dining club. We did pop-ups all around town featuring up-and-coming chefs, and uh, we would do them in kind of off-the-beaten-path locations. We raised about $10 million to do that. At one point, we were in 30 cities, had 90 employees. Um, that was, was a lot of fun. It eventually closed. We failed, uh, ran out of money, couldn't raise any more. And uh, we shut down, and that was in about 2016. And uh, between leaving law in 2013 and and closing Dinner Lab, um, I had started looking at doing pretty small deals, you know, small retail um, renovation work. And when Dinner Lab finally closed, I knew I did not want to go back to to law and wanted to go into development full time. And so just you know hung a shingle and and started. Uh, started looking at deals. What did you learn from the dinner lab failure closing? It doesn't sound like a failure. It actually sounds pretty impressive how you grew it. But what did you learn coming out of that? It was a great experience. Um, it gave me a lot of confidence that you know I could build an enterprise. I could raise money from people. I could manage people. You know, as a lawyer, you're not really managing anybody. And you're kind of in your lane doing your work. And so um, learned a lot about building a, a company and an organization and motivating people. And, you know, while it was a failure in from the financial sense and we didn't get to where we originally set out to, to do and to grow, um, you know, definitely learned a ton. And it gave me the confidence to not go back to law. You know, when, when Dinner Lab closed, I had a few firms reach out and, and make offers to go back and practice. And, um you know, that would have been the, the safer thing to do. And and I just knew I didn't want to do it. And, and a lot of that was confidence from what I'd learned at Dinner Lab. And when you hung that shingle to start your real estate company, did you have any idea what you wanted to do or you knew you just wanted to be in real estate? I just knew I wanted to do deals. And, um, you know, I had some, some inclination of, I knew I was going to start in New Orleans and the market here 
you know, it wasn't particularly strong. Really, there was a robust hospitality market. But other than that, you know, multi industrial retail, like it was all stagnant. You could find good deals, but it wasn't like a, a, a massive market where everybody was making money. And so the first few I did were um, three smaller deals, a, a 5,000 square foot old school gym. It was owned by the Orleans Parish public school system. They had sold it to a private developer pre Katrina. There was a gigantic hole in the roof. You know, it was a basketball court. There was a hole in the roof and rain was pouring in. And uh, it was a historic tax credit deal, which I had gotten to, to know on the legal side. 5,000 square foot building on a 22,000 square foot lot and in uh, an up and coming neighborhood uh, called Bywater here. And that was the first deal. We bought it for $245,000 and uh, put a good chunk, you know, maybe. 700, six, 700 grand into it, which was a lot at the time. And we leased it out to, uh, right now it's NOLA Bark Market. It's a doggy daycare center and an art supply store. And they've been my tenants since then and did two other kind of smaller, um, do uh, one is it was a duplex. The other was a, um, uh, kind of a mixed use, two apartments in a, in a retail spot. That's a bar now and they'll all three of those were together so those were kind of the first three deals they're all tax credit deals and then just how do tax credit there. deals work these are historic tax credit deals so the building needs to have uh some significance historically um usually in, in new orleans most of the the core neighborhoods are historic so these buildings were built probably the early 1920s and um, once you get over that hurdle, uh, you you need to essentially restore the building in a historically appropriate way. So the design of what you do needs to be approved by the state and the federal government. And then on eligible expenses, uh, you get 40% of what you spend. So you spend a million bucks on it and get $400,000 back in the form of tax credits. And then you can either keep the credits or you kind of have a structured financial product and you sell the credits or allocate them to a partner in exchange for capital. And that's most of what I've done has been that structure. And what do you typically do with the credits or does it vary per deal? It varies, but most of them I, I sell or allocate the credits to somebody else. So if I get you know a million dollars worth of credits, I might sell it for 90 cents on the dollar to somebody else. And the way it would generally work is up front, I know that I'm, I've been approved for that million dollars in credits. And uh, as long as I build the building in the way that has been approved, I know I'll get those credits. And I would go to somebody and say, hey, Jake, I got, I got a million dollars of credits in about a year. Do you want to buy it for 90 cents on the dollar? You say yes. And then I would go out and get a bridge loan for that $900,000. And then as soon as I get the credits in, I would say, okay, pick up the phone, Jake, now it's it's time uh, to, to pay me the 900 grand and I here's your million dollars worth of credits. And so it ends up being uh, a way to get free or discounted equity in a deal uh, that you'd otherwise have to come up with uh, equity in the capital stack. And the good thing is you can use your law degree and that unique skill to A, execute on this strategy, which is a little bit more complicated than just some value add thing. But the common theme in that also seems to go back to your portfolio, which is this idea of placemaking and that, you know, we had another guest on who was talking about don't fight the building. And from what I know of your portfolio, it's these just super inspired and historic buildings that are really interesting. So it's it's an awesome marriage that you've been able to sort out. Was the placemaking side always something that was rooted in your kind of DNA and part of your strategy, or did that just kind of happen? I think it, it developed over time, but but it was very intertwined in, I think, my love for New Orleans and the idea that you know, New Orleans is this, there's a an inherent 
tension between preservation and progress. And at times the pendulum swings too much in, in one direction in, in New Orleans. I think, unfortunately, it's on the preservation side, not in a bad way, because I think the, the preservation of the built environment here is what makes it keeps it special and, and makes it special. Um, you know, I'd like to see this, this city progress in other ways. But from my own, you know, if I'm if I'm spending time, t- you know, on on a historic building and the fact that I, I live here and I love the city, everything I do, I want to be a net positive contributor to every neighborhood. And, you know, it's not to say I'm always 100 percent aligned. You know, some neighbors are upset. People have different opinions all the time. But the overall um the overarching and kind of underlying theme is really enhancing either the, the the culture, the neighborhood, the surrounding communities, and really doing something that's accretive to the community and, and, and not a, a detraction. How has New Orleans tra- changed since Katrina? It's It's been a really big change, and I, I would argue for the best, you know, from 1965 to Katrina, New Orleans has been on a kind of a slow population decline. And and other than the the population decline, there was this sense of complacency, you know, business left, people didn't care. It was a good old boys town. Um, You know, people were partying. It's not to say that part hasn't changed, but Katrina was a really big wake up call in the best possible way. There was a renewed sense of civic engagement and activism that was like, hey, if if we don't do something here, this city will become a small cottage city. It will become a, a Charleston. There's nothing wrong with Charleston. I love Charleston, but it's we want to be a bigger city here. And so I think you you had people who otherwise were living the good life and not doing as much really step up to the plate and a, and a generation of people um, that you know, may not have been in, as involved civically, really did an amazing job. And the result has been a big diversification of the economy. You know, the, the kind of the pillars of the city have, have always been oil and gas and the port and, and hospitality, and those are still booming. But we've had a big diversification and um, a lot of biotech, a lot of medical, a lot of just general technology. And that stuff just literally didn't exist here. And there's a, a nice industry around that now. And then things like public education, you know, the the, the, um, the public school system here was in, in terrible shape. Now it's one of the better public school systems in the state. Um, there's, I think it's the largest per capita number of kids in the country in charter school systems. That's really worked well. And, you know, there's still a long way to go to get to, you know, a a top public school system in the country, but it's really had a drastic impact, I think. And, and it's the kind of thing it might take a generation to, to see the the full results, but, you know, stuff like that has been a a major impact. There's, There's a lot more money that has been invested in the city. Uh, we just got a, a billion dollar new airport about three years ago. That's, you know, infrastructure. The city spent about $2 billion on basic services like streets and roads that you think is crazy to even be talking about. But in New Orleans, there's a lot of potholes around, in New Orleans. You know, there's a lot of potholes. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so it's good. You know, there's, you know, we still have a long way to go, but the, the way I'd characterize it is for the first time in 60 years or 70 years, the city's at least kind of pointed in the right direction. Uh, you know, making slow progress. And what does the city need to do to make more progress? What are the things that you're seeing from the inside lines on the real estate side that they need to kick it up a notch? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of the challenges we face now, I think are pretty similar to a lot of big cities around the country. Crime's a problem, still could use a lot of infrastructure improvements. I'd like to see city government operate at a, at a much higher um efficiency and and you know there's some basic services we we could use you know the the flood and sewage and crime all that kind of stuff um i don't think it's a whole lot different than than a lot of other big cities and at some point you started to think about hospitality if there was already a lot of hospitality in new orleans why did you start to transition and add that into your portfolio in addition to the the other investments that you were making? Yeah, I, I, I've always kind of loved hotels. I didn't go to school or, you know, to, to study them or 
develop them and I didn't grow up around them, but I've always just generally loved it. And as I continued to look at and feel like the real estate was where I wanted to go with my career, that was what was growing in New Orleans. I mean, that was, you know, that was what was, that was booming. And um, the first deal I did was a small um, motor lodge in kind of a seedy area of town. It was built in 1958 uh, as the Rose Inn. And um, and when I bought it, it had, um, you know, there's bulletproof windows everywhere. It was known for heroin and prostitution. And um, that was the original, that was the, that was the first hotel deal I did. It, it ended up, we converted it and rebranded it and it became the Drifter Hotel, which I still have. And, um, that was, that was a whole lot of fun. That was kind of the first one. And is it still known for heroin and prostitution or were you able to change it up a little bit? We were able to shift the uh, perception a little bit. Um, we've got a good vibe now. We're at, right now, it's uh, we have an outdoor music venue. We have a swim club. We have a, a coffee shop, a bar. It's still small, 20 keys, but it's kind of got a, um, you know, a, a pool vibe, kind of Palm Springs, Miami vibe in a, in an area town you wouldn't normally think of. And it's, it's become a destination. Um, and, um, we've been able to shake, shake the old reputation. So how, how is it that you do that? Because location is so important with hotels and I've seen a lot of deals that either we've looked at and other people have shown me that it's hard to put your head around a certain location, or you're not sure if it's going to turn the corner. What were you thinking and what were you doing to give your deal the momentum to you know, push people from the outside to come in and change the perception? Yeah, you know, looking back, it's it's kind of one of those things you probably wouldn't, I wouldn't want to go do that deal again. And in a lot of ways, it was a lot of luck. We, um, we had a, a really good team together. We had a, a design perspective on it that was different than what was in New Orleans at the time. And we created this kind of safe enclave. You know, the idea was for people to express themselves, be who they wanted to be, you know, welcoming of, of absolutely everybody. Um, and it just it just worked well. We, we you know, a lot of a lot of ways we got lucky. Um, you know, the, the service and the hospitality side was was heavy and went into it. But I wouldn't say that's the only thing. There are plenty of, of amazing spots around the city that deliver really great service and hospitality. So I think it was it was a combination of, of luck. It was a combination of the the design, the service, and and the timing was was right. We got we got lucky in a lot of ways. It's hard to make money on twenty rooms, though. So, how do you figure? How did you figure out how to do that? And is the membership club a way to offset some of these fixed costs that you just can't get around on a twenty room hotel? I guess the live music venue might be the same thing. Yes. Yeah. The, the membership club and really the, the F and B inclusive of the, the live music component, um, has helped a lot. You know, the, the hotel side is kind of a limited service model, but most of our volume comes from locals. It's become a destination. So, you know, we probably do events three, three nights a week or so on uh, during during swim season. And in a lot of ways, you know, New Orleans, it's a very cyclical town for the hospitality market, but where the summer months where most of the hotels are getting crushed, that's our, our high season essentially with the pool and swim club. So it's worked out. And then we do get a lot of, we have a lot of normal hotel guests as you'd think of, but then we, we get a lot of, you know, Hey, I've been at the the pool club all day. Let's make it a sleepover and and that you know some carryover from that type of stuff. Um, so that's that's worked really well. We put a lot into programming and and vibe and experience. So we have kind of rotating food trucks and a lot of pop ups. We don't charge for any of that, and we have the benefit of um, not only keeping ideas and 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 uh, experience fresh, but they also all market their own pop-ups at the drifter and so it brings in a new crowd and it's kind of worked pretty well as a cycle and every time i've been to new orleans 
It feels like there's a lot of these big convention hotels. Then you go into the French Quarter and there are these small cutesy hotels, but they feel a little bit touristy. When you set out to do the Drifter and Hotel St. Vincent, did you have an intention that the vibe and the design needed to be something that was totally different from what currently existed? And is that what you set out to do? That's what we set out to do. There's a lot of the the kind of stereotypical saxophonist standing on the street corner, New Orleans thing. And we wanted like the anti that, you know, the drifter, there is, there's nothing that references New Orleans. There's, there's no signage whatsoever. You could drive by on the street and think it's a nondescript, you know, beige random building. And we wanted kind of a wow factor when you walked in, you're like, oh my God, this is on Tulane Avenue. This is crazy. And um, we didn't want the the traditional, you know, beignet saxophone type type thing. And same thing with Hotel St. Vincent. You know, we that was designed as as it's in an area. It's on a street called Magazine Street in the Lower Garden District. So it's not core French Quarter kind of tourist area. So it was designed from the get go as a neighborhood hotel integrated into the neighborhood. Uh, Magazine Street is a is a pretty amazing street with a lot of galleries and shops and restaurants. And so we wanted to emphasize the kind of the neighborhood living component rather than the, the tourist side of it. I've been to that hotel and Hotel St. Vincent is one of those that will no doubt become the iconic hotel in New Orleans. It has such a good energy, the way that you were able to add on and still pay homage to the bones of the building. I think it was like, you know, this old scary orphanage building that you brought all this life to. I didn't see any ghosts, which was a good thing, but it was, the execution was just so high. Thank you. I really, I really appreciate that. That was a, that was a fun one. And I I went from the drifter to, to hotel St. Vincent. So it was a, a big jump, but, um, a really amazing project. And how do you jump that big from a 20 room hotel? There's a motel in a really bad part of town to getting what people must have thought from the outside is this iconic piece of real estate. A lot of luck that went into that too. I mean, there was a lot of, um, persistence that we, we, uh, had put in five offers over the years from 2011 until 20. 16 when I got it under contract and you know the owner always said you know here's my number and you'd hit the number and he was like no no I've got another number we'll talk next year type of thing and um it was a pretty wild situation where the owner disappeared um it's he, it's still an open case with the NOPD his body's never been found um he had a one way ticket to Ireland never boarded the plane all sorts of rumors, weird situation. And then, wow. um, so I, I got it under contract. The, the, uh, building was then owned by his widow and his, uh, ex-wife and they didn't particularly like each other. Uh, then the ex-wife passed away. And so it was owned by the widow and the ex-wife's adopted daughter. And so I, we had to go into court, open a succession, have a curator appointed all the while, there's this common theme. They also read drugs and prostitution. It was a weird and your law degree, situation. by the way. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. it's all coming back, man. Exactly. That's right. It's it's all uh, you know. It's good for something. Um, and so we went through this long process of you know having it under contract. They didn't carry any insurance. I was worried that at one at any moment the thing was going to go up in smoke and I'd lose everything and. Um, it just, you know, it, it worked out well. We finally, um, was able, was able to raise some money. That was the, the biggest, uh, acquisition I had done personally at that time and, um, you know, worked out and then we had to figure out how to get it financed for construction. So let's talk about, there's a lot to unpack there. You raised a lot of money for your food dining startup then I'm guessing you were syndicating some of these real estate deals. How were you structuring your deals and kind of those early ones where you were getting started? And did you keep doing that the same way or did you start to bring in new partners and institutional partners? 
we've I've brought in a lot of new partners, but I still have a lot of the same partners who have reinvested many times over the years with me. Um, it started off kind of friends and family, uh, going to people small, twenty five grand here, fifty grand there type of stuff. And you know, as the deal size grew, the network of of people grew along with the amount of money I needed. And it was all all pretty much through referrals. So you know, I, I was still you know, pounding the pavement and, and meeting with people, but I got a lot of, uh, you know, prior investors who had good experience saying, Hey, talk to my friend, he's interested, you know, that sort of stuff. And, um, that's, that's most of what I've done. It's all been through a syndicate kind of real estate, private equity model. Um, we've done a few institutional deals, but most of, of what I've done have, have been family office and, and high net worth. Um, and most of the deals, they're not all structured the same way. Some of the earlier ones are more joint venture type structures, but but a lot of these are done in a more traditional private equity type fashion with a preferred return and a hurdle and then a split. GPLP model, it's the best. We grew the same way, just word of mouth. It kept clicking, 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 clicking. More people came into the network and it compounded. It's a, it's amazing how it's a common story for a lot of people, particularly so in hospitality, because investors can walk inside these buildings and see the deal. They can see the investment, which is pretty unique. Were, were a lot of your investors based in New Orleans or were you rounding up people from throughout the country as you started getting a little bit bigger? All the original stuff was New Orleans. People in New Orleans are in the region. And, you know, as we've grown, we've, you know, there's, we have a bunch of investors from Texas and California and New York and Florida. And it's all, it's grown as the deals have grown and as the network has grown. So there's always this moment, you get the deal under control and then you're like, oh, I got to go raise all this money and oh, I got to get the debt. So how does that look on Hotel St. Vincent? And when did the debt come? When did the equity come? You had to deal with a court order. Was there a hurried timeline? Unpack that for me. Yeah, that is a uh, so that one's a, it was a unique story. We we got um, I brought in a a co sponsor at the time who had a lot more money than me, and um, we together went and got uh, he he put up the deposit, and we went and got a loan from a regional lender, just a kind of an ordinary bank. And um, I remember the about four days before we were closing. The loan docs were sent over, and at the time, our, our, my arrangement with with this my my co GP was he was going to guarantee the debt, and I wasn't guaranteeing it, and that was what the commitment letter said. And and then the loan docs come out, and there's you know Zach Kupperman continuing unlimited guarantee. It was for five point three million dollars, and I almost had a panic attack, and I was like, this this is not the deal. And I called the loan officer, and I'm like you know, what is going on here? And he's like, Hey, this is what the committee approved. I'm sorry, but this, this is it. If you don't want to do it, we're not going to close. You know, this is, this wow. is the deal. And I remember just having a panic attack and I was like, this is ridiculous. I was just so pissed off and, um, trying to think of what to do. I remember calling Emily, my wife and, and telling her, and she was like, whatever, whatever, whatever you think, Zach. I'm like, if it doesn't go well, like we're bankrupt, it's not going to work. <laughs> She's like, that's okay. Like, I believe in you you know, that's okay. And, and, and it ended up that night, that was on a Tuesday. We were supposed to close on a Friday. You know, I slept on it the next day. I was like, let's go. We're doing it. That's fine. And, you know, had it been months of being mentally prepared, I would have been fine for it, you know, but it was just the shock and the last minute nature of the whole thing. And um, so that was on a Tuesday, Wednesday, I tell them we're in, we're supposed to close on that Friday. And we have a, an investor who had committed a million dollars, who was, um, it was a good chunk of, of the purchase price. Um, tell us Thursday night at like five thirty six o'clock that he was out and we were supposed to go close the next morning. All the docs had been done with the seller and it was a kind of a hairy situation with the sellers anyway. And, um, so we're like, Oh my God, what are we going to do? And, um, we we went in the next morning and we were, we were at our law firm. We were in one room. The lender was in a different conference room. The <laughs> sellers were in a different conference room. And we made the decision at the time, which looking back, even, even at the moment, I knew it was, was kind of wrong, but my, the, the partners with us, 
they wanted to basically go in and say, hey, we're closing, but at a million dollars less, take it or leave it. Kind of yep. thing. And, and strong arm them. And that just did not go over well. And the sellers are like, thanks. We're going to be here the entire day and we're going to sue you if you don't perform kind of thing. Right. And it was literally like, it must have been eight or nine hours of trying to figure out a deal back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it just, we got nowhere. And at this point, the, the, um, our partner, the, the sponsor who had put up the deposit, um, you know, he had kind of soured on the deal. This was like the end of the day, like 550, we we're going to leave at six and the seller's like, we're out of here and we're going to file a lawsuit against you. And we ended up, figuring out the the uh the sponsor our, our co-gp we made an offer to basically buy him out of his deposit at 40 cents on the dollar because in his mind he was gone you he know, was gonna deposit, lose it the deposit's gone he's gonna lose the whole thing so we uh and this is like sweating high stakes like just thinking about it makes me it was it was kind of wild i've never this had is what it's all like about for yeah it was i mean it's fun and it's a great story now looking back on it but it was it was wild a lot of yelling the lender had left by this point was was really pissed off about the whole situation um so we ended up buying out the deposit at 40 cents in the dollar and then i went to the sellers and said look we'll release the entire deposit let us buy six weeks. And that was the deal we ended up striking. So we released the deposit, wrote him a check that day. They walked away with the money in, in hand. So we couldn't have fought over it later. And, and we bought it, bought ourselves six weeks. Um, the trick had been that the, the code GP we brought in was now out. He was done the deal. And because he was gone, the lender was gone. You know, the lender was doing the deal because yep. of him anyway. And at that point, had six weeks, and we scrambled and tried to meet with everybody under the sun. And we ended up doing it well, and we 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 got um, um, a, another partner and raised the rest of the money and closed six weeks later. And it ended up working out, but it was a it was a wild six weeks. It was a wild six weeks. We had a and similar thing the, happen. That was the acquisition financing. It was another year and a half for the for the construction financing. You had something similar. Oh, wow. yeah. So we um, had a deal and we were supposed to go hard and our 50% joint venture partner, well, we were hard and our 50% joint venture partner a week before closing said they're not closing. It was some crazy situation unrelated to the deal. It, it, there was like, it, it was a foreign family and and whatever. So we had to scramble, buy an extra 30 days and bring in, we ended up bringing an institutional partner. But what I learned from that is you always have these deposit sharing agreements. So if one partner goes bye-bye, you can keep the deposit. And we ended up keeping the deposit and in investing in the wow. deal. And um, it was what we had to do because we ended up getting a worse deal than what we had. It was a different structure. So it, it happens to everyone and sometimes the best deals have the craziest beginnings. So now you got the acquisition loan, you're trying to figure out what to do. When do you start really going deep and building out the business plan on the hotel? <clears throat> yeah, so at that, at that stage, we knew um, we had a, a deal with Bunkhouse, Bunkhouse Group, and Liz Lambert had actually come in. She she had uh, joined me in the in the partnership side in a bigger way and became a co GP with us in the deal. And How did you come to Bunkhouse? I had been, um, you know, I had I had really loved a lot of Liz's work and and had followed her for a long time, and when. Uh, when I got it under contract, we'd reached out to a few different groups, but I, I really, Liz was kind of who I wanted to work with. And when we reached out, she knew the property already. She had tried to buy it years before from the same guy unsuccessfully as had so many others. And so it was immediately like, I love it. I'm in, let's do this, you know, type of thing. There was no selling. She'd been, she had shared a bottle of wine with the guy at one point, year, five years before. So she knew it. And I mean, the building just really sold itself. It had so much character. 
and um, and was able to work work with her and um, the the partnership developed really nicely. Um, Liz, she ended up you know leaving Bunkhouse and joining um, Larry McGuire and Tommy Mormon at MMH. They rebranded it as MML. And so Liz and Larry are my partners. Is another another partner named Christian Strobel, who um, has a has a, a bunch of hotels called Base Camp Hotels that he's he's done and he runs. So we, you know, Christian joined the team and he had worked with with Liz quite a bit. And um, we then went out and we knew we had a general idea of the concept and and that was the core team. And then went out to try to find some money. And um, we went to a lot of a lot of lenders nationally. There was one bank locally. Uh, it, it's called Iberia Bank. Uh, yep. Now it's called First, First Horizon. And Iberia had financed six or seven deals for me already. And there was a, a loan officer there, a, 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 a VP named Megan Donnellan. And Megan actually did the drifter. She, you know, she had fought the bank originally said no to doing the drifter and she fought and got the drifter done. And she had done that first deal in the bywater. And um, so she was there and was a real internal champion at the bank for for working with me and then doing this deal. And it took probably over a year to finally convince the bank to do it. And, you know, all the while we were going through design and entitlements, there was a, a big entitlement process we went through. But finally, um, finally, Iberia was was on board and we closed that about a year and a half, uh, the, the, the construction loan a year and a half after we bought the building. And they they're still our lender now. They did the senior loan, they did the tax credit bridge loan. And then they're also our federal historic tax credit investor. So it worked out really well. And. Um, there's a, a guy there named Ben Dupuy, and there's an, another gentleman named Cliff Worley who led the tax credit group, and they went above and beyond in in putting the the whole package together as well. So it was a, a in a lot of ways it was very lucky, and in, in a lot of ways it was you know relationship built over years, and it and it ended up working out really nicely. Another tax credit deal. Here you are another again. Tax credit deal. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, so. For those that don't know, Liz Lambert is one of these iconic hoteliers, you know, on the level of Ian Schrager, Andre Balas, but really for this, you know, she's she's well known for like retro motels, huge present in Austin and an incredible design sense. And she's often, she's even done some higher end hotels and everyone is just so curated and so unique. When you are going into a deal with someone that is that good, how do you think about structuring kind of the business deal and then figuring out who does what? Great question. I mean, in in this case, it was pretty easy because... I knew, and and one of the main reasons I want I wanted to work with Liz was her design sense and and programming and the vibe, and so I just knew like, hey, that's that's her expertise. She's going to run with that. And uh, Liz and Larry created a design firm. Uh, it's called Lambert McGuire Design, and so the partnership hired their firm to do the whole thing. And really, Liz and Larry together and their team did an amazing job. Um, just designing the whole thing. And, and I knew that just, I wasn't going to be doing it. You know, I, I was in the meetings and followed along, but it was kind of like, I'm, I'm going to stay out of their way. And and that's where a lot of the magic was. And they ran with it and they didn't have as much interest in doing the development and the financing and the deal side either. And, you know, that was where, what I love doing. And so it just, it was an easy division of responsibilities that's worked really well to this day. I've never really seen a hotel budget for a great hotel that didn't get a little bit blown and you have to dip into some contingency. What what did you learn on that deal working with such a design-centric, passionate group? And how did you kind of wrestle with knowing that this thing's going to turn out unbelievable, but you also had to make it a profitable investment? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, this this deal... It was interesting because on on one hand, you know, Larry and Liz and uh, their their team. There's a, a designer named Ellie Lockridge who led a lot of their efforts, who was amazing. 
they really focus exclusively on creating the best product. And it's not like they were, they wanted to spend all the money in the world, but really first and foremost, it was what is the product and how do we get there regardless of, of the cost or the time or, you know, how you view it. And so on some, in some respects, yes, we, we spent more than we had originally planned for. <clears throat> on the other hand, you know, the, in this case, the designers are my my partners in a really big way in the in the real estate, and so you kind of know the interests are aligned long term on creating the best product at the hotel. And so it was, I think, easier than if it were a true total third party designer running with it. And um, it's it's worked out really really well, and I'm glad I'm glad it worked that way. Um, one of the the perverse benefits too of of a tax credit deal is that even when you, you spend a little bit more than you originally budgeted for, if you spend it in the right ways, then you're getting tax credits on the extra money also. So you you still have a little bit coming back to you. And so that was that was the case here. We 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 ended up with some surplus tax credits. That's like the best of both worlds. I mean, you get an amazing product and you get this tax break. I'm going to have to start po- finding some of these tax credit deals. What are what would surprise someone most about a tax credit deal that would give you pause before jumping in? There's a lot of design constraints that really can impact the the product. You know, they care, they meaning the uh, state historic preservation office, you know, statewide, and then the National Park Service. There's a set of objective standards that you might not want to do. You know, you want to change your flooring, and they say no. You want to, you know, you want to do drywall, and they say, hey, you need plaster, or vice versa. Too bad, you got to do it. They don't want you to add this lighting here, and they say, too bad. You want to put a window here to make the ambiance in the restaurant better? Too bad. You can't do it. So I think that's by far and away the biggest problem is making sure your vision for what you're trying to create jives with what they say you can do. Because if you know you can just not do it, but then you lose all the tax credits. So it's you know a pretty big bummer if that happens. Do you manage the hotel or does someone else manage it for you? Hotel St. Vincent is managed by MML Hospitality, which is the management arm that uh, Larry and Tommy and Liz own. So they they manage it now. The other hotels, we, we have six total and we only self-manage one. Um, I don't love the management side. I'd, I'd rather be doing the development and the deals. Why is that? So that's... It's just more fun for me, and I, my background isn't in operations, and I just don't love the day-to-day operational stuff. I think it's that's probably like the most important piece is is you know running the hotels. I mean, as you know, the hotel it's it's a business just as much as it is a real estate deal, and so that's a gigantic part of the equation is making sure it's operated efficiently. But there are a lot of people who can do it better than I than I can, and and so it's not not an area of focus of mine. Yeah. Being vertically integrated, we definitely view as a competitive advantage for us. And we end up get getting brought into deals where the developer just doesn't know anything about a hotel. And I often find that they're surprised about how focused we are about the operation side of things, even under you know the design and the development process, because we're going to have to operate it at the end of the day, were there like little tidbits that you picked up from Liz and Larry as to how they are thinking about operating the hotel while designing the hotel and coming up with the brand and the story? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. And I think you're right that that has gone into it. I mean, all the, the kind of technical services and the planning during development of, hey, how is this thing going to actually operate? I think with Hotel St. Vincent, it was more seamless in a way because the same group designing it was was essentially going to run it. So that was a, a good fact pattern to have on that deal on, on some of the other hotels, it's it's a little bit more disjointed, which I think is probably more normal in how it's done, but it is so crucial, the operational side. Um, and if you miss that and you're making a decision 
uh, like a concession for a design related reason, but then be, it becomes a, an operational nightmare. You know, that's that's not a good situation to be in. I want to talk a little bit about your strategy because you've done a lot of things. So how, how where are you focusing now and what are you focusing on or are you just very opportunistic and you're drawn to a neighborhood and then you figure it out when you get there? We're still pretty opportunistic. I think it's not necessarily a good thing because we, we don't only have one platform doing one thing and it making it easy. You know, we, we tend to like the hairier deals and maybe that's part of the lawyer in me and the, the puzzle, you know, problem solving side that I like, but doesn't make it easier. I'd say the, the focus areas, hotels are, are a focus area, um, kind of historic buildings are a focus area regardless of, of asset class. And then um, we've done a bunch of mobile home park deals, and that's a it's a it's a separate platform exclusively on on mobile home parks. Uh, but even outside of those three, you know, I'm, I, we have we had a music venue. We're we're looking at you know we've pretty much done every, a little bit of everything other than industrial, um, and you know we still look at at retail or, or multi. We're doing a little bit more in the multi world now. Um, but you know we've we've done kind of one bigger deal for us which was 86 86 units um that's the biggest one we've done so far we're looking at a few others do your investors ever express uh concern or uh want you to pause on diversifying so much or is that what they love about you no one's expressed concern. I don't know that they love that about us anyway. Um, I think what I've learned is the different investors have a different profile of what they're looking for. We've got a bunch that love the mobile home park stuff and a bunch that hate the mobile home parks. Some of them love the hotels. A lot of them don't want to touch the hotels. So I, you know, there's there's knowing who to go to and who is interested and what their kind of risk tolerance and profile is has gone a long way. You know, our deals are not for everybody because they're not the same. They're not all the same deal. I think people, I think our, our group, you know, we've had a good track record. We've had all successes knock on wood so far. Everything's been good. We've had good returns. And so I think that's the main thing and, you know, treating people right and, and, you know, focusing kind of a, with a, an investor first mindset, I think is the main, you know, that's what I would want as an investor, regardless of what my sponsor's doing, you know, making sure that I know I'm t being taken care of. And it's, you know, pretty simple. It, it's time consuming to spend the time to do it right on the kind of investor relations partnership front, you know, being a good partner is as much work as doing the deals in a lot of cases. It's a lot of work. Um, yeah, it's a lot of work. So, but it's, you know, I'm, I enjoy talking to people. I'm a people person. And so it's, it's, you know, it's not, it's, it's a good thing for how we've built the business so far. Are there any big opportunities right now that you're thinking of, whether it's a strategy or a specific deal that's just keeping you up at night with excitement? We've got a few I'm really excited about. There's um, a hotel in Aspen that we're doing that is just, I uh, love being, you know, not, not a bad place to have to go to work, travel to Aspen. Um, and that's a big hotel deal. Um, it's going to be just an incredible product. Really, we're, we're focusing a lot on creating the best of the best. And so that's kind of a fun, a fun deal. And it's also really challenging to develop in Aspen. It's a small town. There are almost no subs of scale. So everybody has to come in from Denver or Glenwood Springs or somebody else. So it's really, really challenging. It's very expensive. It's a very pro environment, you know, not in some respects, anti-development, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a lot to, to go through. It's very challenging, but that's a, a fun one that it's, you know, actively, actively working a lot on that one. You're always underselling this deal. I, I think this deal is like probably one of the top five deals to come out of COVID. I think you got it off market. From what I read, it seemed like everyone's been trying to buy this thing for years. How do you, a guy from New Orleans, 
buy this iconic piece of real estate, like in the center of town in Aspen, across from the St. Regis, across from the rugby field. How's that happen? It's a lot of luck that went into it on this one. Um, you know, I had been going to Aspen a, a lot and I, everywhere I go, I'm, I'm looking, looking at deals. I'll cold call people. I'll, I'll look at, at stuff. And I'd seen this one before, but this one actually, Larry McGuire, who we talked about earlier, um, he had opened a restaurant in, in Aspen. Um, and you know, this was really his deal. He found this through a connection, uh, in the market and was introduced to the family that had owned it, which was the family that built it. And um, Larry and I had been working really well together on St. Vincent's. And so he invited me into the deal and the two of us worked to, to put it under contract and then close on it. And in a lot of ways, it was a, an exercise in relationship building with the family. Um, you know, they had been approached every year, you know, out the wazoo, people wanted to buy it, you know, and um, the mo most people, I think, ha came to them with a, a plan of demolishing the whole thing and trying to, you know, build condos or some brand new hotel. And we we took the opposite approach. And it was like, look, hey, we we do historic redevelopment. Everything we do is about the community and honoring what's there and working within those confines. Uh, we brought them down to see St. Vincent's, you know, some of those family members came to the opening we had and um, we just built that relationship over time. And, and our pitch was like, look, we want to actually honor what your family has built. Their their father had first built the first part of, of the Mountain Chalet in 1957 and the wow. same family, the Melville family had has owned and operated. And they've added on over the years until we bought it in 2021. And so a lot of it was that relationship building approach, you know, and we said, look, we want to, we want to keep the, the structure. We're going to, you know, demo this here and there and redo the whole thing, but we're going to keep the core of, of what's there. And, um, you know, some, some of those family members came into the deal with us and, um, you know, they, they actually still operate it to this day. That was part of our deal. It was until we, we break ground on construction, they can still run it. And so that was, that was a lot of it. Um, and then I think, you know, a lot, a lot of it was luck with the, the families kind of next generation, not wanting to go into the business and they were kind of spread out a little bit. So there was, there was definitely luck there, but a lot of it was, you know, luck on the introduction and then a lot of work, uh, Larry and I, and, and, um, have our other partners put into meeting with the family and, and spending the time just talking and, and, you know, spending the time with them. And this is a pretty big deal. It's going to be expensive. We just talked about that. Do you capitalize this with an institutional partner or were you able to syndicate it out with a bunch of high net worth and family offices? So we, when we bought it, we, um, we basically worked with family offices and that was it. There's there no institutional partner. Um, and, there's a small group of, of people that invested and that's, that's basically it. And part of the idea behind it was we'd like to own this asset forever. I think, you know, it's something we want to keep and, and didn't necessarily want the pressure that would have come with an institutional firm to sell it in five or seven years or whatever it might be. You know, maybe we end up doing that anyway, but the idea is this, we want to, you know, spend the right focus and time and money on creating the best possible product that we'd like to own forever. So it was an intentional decision not to go that route. What were some of the core decisions you've made in thinking about the design and some of the uses? We wanted, we knew we wanted to add um, a, a lot more F and B and, and spa. So we, we've, we've got the current plans. We're going to add three, three new restaurants. Uh, one is an unbelievable steakhouse. Another is an in, going to be an intimate sushi bar. And then the third is going to kind of be an all day, a little bit more casual, um, spot, you know, sandwiches, burgers, salads. Uh, we're going to do an outdoor beer garden. So there's kind of an interior courtyard in one portion of it that there's, there's really no outdoor beer gardens, you know, for the summer in Aspen and, so that was a differentiator. And then the spa is going to be different. It's not quite going to be as traditional 
um, with just massages and stuff like that. We're going to do some wet treatments and, and, you know, part of the idea is really focusing on fitness and adventure and, and, you know, high impact sports. And so doing, putting into some pretty interesting treatments and elements that, uh, don't exist in Aspen right now. And Aspen is such a big sports town, not just skiing, but you've mountain biking and hiking and climbing and, you know, focusing on the wellness side of it. You know, we looked around at what what else had been done in the city and, you know, none of that existed. So that was a big piece. Um, and then just looking at, you know, the other, there's a lot of really amazing hotels in the town, but none of them are taking the approach that we're taking to be a little bit different. Um, you know, we're going to we're going to keep the kind of Swiss chalet style that's that's currently there, but really upgrade it and elevate it. And Liz and Larry are doing the design. Yes. It's going to be amazing. So you're never going to sell this asset. When you were structuring kind of the JV, and we don't have to go into all the specifics, but how did you think of investing in one of these never sell assets as a sponsor? Good question. I mean, yeah, this this deal, the, the structure is a little bit different than a, a normal um, traditional private equity GPLP structure because of of that and and the way we thought about it was look we know long term this is just going to be an amazing asset it's going to take a long time to develop there's pitfalls around entitlements and costs and environment and all that kind of stuff but we're here for the long term and and we kind of want to structure it knowing that we're going to be partners in this deal hopefully forever and um so there's a real patient mindset going in and then you, you know you had to be really comfortable with all the other the people you're you're bringing in on the investment side which which we were how important in today's hospitality world is integrating the food and beverage into the whole experience of the hotel for the types of hotels we do it's it's crucial it's you know very very important it is the experience and the, the full guest experience um, plays a really big, you know, the, the F&B and the non-hotel, traditional hotel amenities go a really long way. And, um, you know, part of what we want to do here and the other hotels, all, all of them have kind of been a neighborhood destination. We, we want to focus on drawing in locals just as much as we do for the travelers. And for the hotels we've done, you know, none of them are major convention hotels. They're not big group hotels. You know, we play a little bit on the group side, but we, we're not competing with giant ballrooms and, and big conference spaces. So the, the other side of that is making it really interesting from a, hey, a placemaking, I want to be here standpoint. And so at the, the F&B is important. The programming is, is really important at, um, at St. Vincent's. We've got uh, a bar called the Chapel Club where we do regular events. We've got um, a, a jazz series we do. We've got a, a, a tattoo artist in residence series. We've, we've done a whole sorts of uh, burlesque shows and um, we've got live paintings and, and a lot of a lot of music. And so keeping that vibe going um, is, is part of the DNA, the kind of the experiential piece of it. A lot of hotel entrepreneurs are somewhat hesitant to go full independent. There's a lot of these soft brands popping up. Obviously, there's Hilton and Marriott, and that's the safe choice. I am drawn to independent hotels. That's where I like to stay. That's where I like to go. How have you seen being involved in Hotel St. Vincent and your other independent hotels? How are you seeing them compete against the market? Or are you creating your own market in the neighborhoods that you're investing in? It's difficult, I think, to be independent. In a lot of ways, you've got to have a really compelling product or are willing to take a, a longer ramp up time. Um, you know, we we started off the Drifter with with a soft brand called Design Hotels. It's now part of. It was bought by Star Road. Now it's part of Marriott. Um, it was interesting. We drew a lot of European travelers, but they they didn't do a whole, a whole lot else. You know, and and we um, were no longer with them. It, it was they've got a pretty interesting niche, and long term, I'm I'm glad we 
we are, we're now independent and that's worked well. Uh, but it's difficult. And even as independent, you know, going through OTAs, you're giving up so much on, on you know, the fee side. It's kind of wild. St. Vincent's has worked really well. We're not on any OTAs and we're independent. And um, that has, it's all direct bookings and and a little bit of of kind of group stuff and, and corporate accounts that that now we've built up over time. But it's it's a challenge. You know, usually it's it's really tough. I think we've got Hotel St. Vincent has a very special spot in the market, both in terms of the brand positioning and the product, also the location. You know, we're a little bit farther uptown. We're in the Garden District. So, you know, if if you want to be in the French Quarter, that's not us anyway, but we're also not competing with 20,000 rooms, right, in the French Quarter. So in a lot of ways, that's a, it's a unique situation, but it's it's worked it's worked pretty well so far. So we were in New Orleans, I don't know, a year ago, a year and a half ago. We stayed at the Hotel St. Vincent and we were touring a hotel. I think it was in the French Quarter. And after one day, I'm like, we're not investing in any hotel unless it's in this garden district. Like, this is where you want to be. And I think it was because of the neighborhood. Maybe it was because of the scale. But I actually think a lot of people are going to start finding these not tertiary locations, but more neighborhood residential experiences and hotels in those markets are going to do pretty well. And you're seeing it at Hotel St. Vincent. Aspen's a little bit of the same. It's going to hit. Yeah, it's it's been fun. I think people, you know, they, they want something a little different. I, I would say even though the French Quarter is, you know, can be very touristy, um, what I think has set it apart long term is since 1967, there's been a moratorium on hotel rooms in the French Quarter. So what that has done has prevented it from turning into Disneyland. It is a real residential neighborhood. There's plenty of tourist stuff there, but it is still a very real residential neighborhood. It's about 2,000 residents or so that live there, and it keeps it authentic and and good. So I still love the French Quarter, but you know, when I if I were not living in New Orleans and, and coming there, there's still so much special stuff to discover in more residential neighborhoods like Lower Garden or the Garden District or the Marigny, the Bywater, that I think you're right. There, there is, there is more. Um, there's, there's a lot of other really cool hotels in New Orleans. There's one uptown uh, called the Chloe that's done an amazing job, a real neighborhood hotel. Another, another one uh, in the Marigny called Hotel Peter and Paul Converted Church, really cool historic building. A uh, friend of mine, Natalie Jordy, did that one. And, but, you know, both really cool, great neighborhood hotels. And, you know, you'll, I think you'll see more of those in other cities pop up as well. And that's another one where we went to the Peter and Paul, we toured that. And some people will be like, why do I want to stay over here? It feels kind of out of the way. But when you go to the hotel, you're like, this is why I want to stay here because the experience is so rich and the architecture is so good and what they had there was really well executed. So I, I think that as we move on in hospitality, a lot more folks are going to get comfortable investing in independent hotels off the beaten path and then spend more money investing on the experience side. I think you're dead on. That's exactly right. Well, you're great at building hotels, but you're also really good at tearing them down. And one deal that I know about that you're doing, and I'm smiling because we've looked at it, a lot of people have tried to do this, and that is convert like an older limited service extended stay hotel into apartments. And I think you're working on a Homewood that you ripped off the brand and now you're making apartments. And I just got someone was asking me, hey, there's an extended stay portfolio that's going up for auction. You know, do you think I should buy this and convert it to apartments? Can you kind of walk us through how those deals work and what your experience has been converting a hotel into multi? Yeah, so we're we're finished. We're just finishing now this month. We actually signed our first lease two days ago. There you um, go on on this deal. It's in a, a small community right outside New Orleans called Covington, Louisiana, and um, it was a Homewood Suites, and um, 
we we bought the, the the business plan going in was you know buy it we terminated Hilton and um, you know kind of redo the rooms very light pip all kind of aesthetic stuff upgrades to the kitchens and then do it as you know lease it as a, as a traditional multifamily apartment building and it's worked pretty well in this case the building. Um, you know, it was, I think it was built in 06, redone in 11. So it wasn't too old. Um, all of the rooms had full kitchens as opposed to little kitchenettes. So we didn't have to run new plumbing or anything. I'd say the, the biggest kind of major thing was the decision to add washer dryers in the units and do some venting for that. But the way the building was laid out, it wasn't too big of a lift either. So on that deal, you know, we, we went in. We threw away, we, we donated all, all the FF&E, ripped up the carpet, repainted. Um, we redid, you know, reglazed tubs, in some cases, new bathrooms, all new toilets. We put in the washer dryer. We redid some of the cabinets and uh, all the appliances. Um, and then that, that was really, I mean, I say that's it. It was a lot and we're, we're almost done. But, you know, it's pretty interesting that the building had a really large lobby that's now this amazing great room that, you know, for uh, at a hotel, you might have had events there and there was a little ballroom. We turned into a fitness center and providing extra storage. But it's, it was actually set up really nicely. There's there's two outdoor pools. They had grills. We redid, you know, refinished some of the pool. There's a little putting green. We built a dog park. It wasn't a major development deal. It was, you know, more of a soft kind of value add piece to it. And the market, this particular market in Covington, uh, even though it's it's New Orleans, it's it's a little bit outside of the city, and so it's a, it's a growing residential community with a pretty nice demand on the multi side and no new supply coming in, into the market at all, which we we knew going in, but it also been very lucky. Um, and th- when COVID hit, the tourist demand, you know, dropped really, you know, but by, by drastically. And so I think the, the seller we bought it from had been struggling a little bit uh, as well. And the, the economics made sense to to go pursue the conversion route. Did it end up costing about what you thought? Did you spend more money? Did you spend less money? How how were the conversion costs relative to your initial expectations? It was it was more than originally un- underwrote looking at the deal to begin with. But by the time we closed, we've we've pretty much kept on budget. You know, with with a within a margin of error. Um, we originally we looked at doing the deal, doing the construction with a traditional general contractor, and those bids came in really high. Um, I knew that I didn't want to manage this. I have no experience managing larger multifamily. This would have been large for us, 86 units. And uh, so we we knew we we had a partner that uh, a company called Key Real Estate, they're based in New Orleans. They've probably got 4,000 or so units around the state and a few other states. So the the owner is is a friend of mine and uh, we, we were going to have them manage it anyway. And when all of the general contracting bids came came back to expensive. We looked at ways to cut costs and we came to them and said, hey, look, these are basically unit turns that you would do anyway in all your other buildings. Do you have the capacity and are you interested in, in you know, managing the work? And they said yes. And it was a, it's been a big cost savings. And it's been great because they they brought a bunch of relationships to the table where, you know, the contractor, you're going out and rebidding everything and working with new subs. And here it's like, well, they got three carpet guys they do every deal with and it's real quick and they've got yep. a few tile people and some lighting guys. And so it's it's worked really well. Um, not only the, the cost, their costs have been down, but the the leveraging of the existing relationships for this exact product has gone really well. Are you on the hunt for more? Definitely on the hunt for more. You know, I think this this the concept of the conversion has, has gained a lot of steam. So the deals are harder to find and harder to come by. But yeah, we're definitely on the hunt for more. Um, I, I think it's a pretty compelling opportunity, especially with construction costs being out the wazoo in, in a lot of a lot of places. Really, really challenging. You know, I think there's a, a pretty good 
margin if you find the right deal going in and there's such a high demand for for multifamily in a lot of these spots that that uh it's been a good business plan so far and we're definitely looking for more some of these hotels obviously for those that don't know when they get to a certain age the brand won't issue what's typically called a pip and that's a property improvement plan and that's here's what's needed to keep it as a homewood suites or a residence in eventually marriott or hilton are like hey you know, we're kind of done with this thing. It's too old. It's beyond our prototype. We don't really want it. That's a little rare. A lot of the times they're like, yeah, we want this thing. We want you to re-up. What what, what did you do to get rid of the Homewood brand? And then as you move forward, how are you going to approach franchise encumbrances? Great question. And, and I think in this case, you know, when when the the brand says to the owner, "Hey, we we want you to re up, but by the way, it's going to cost you a million bucks, two million bucks, five million bucks, whatever it is," that's a, that's a moment that creates a selling opportunity. I think in a lot of people's minds, the, the seller doesn't necessarily want to reinvest, and um, I think that was the case here, and it it worked for us because we did, we were going to change the product anyway. We didn't want what they were going to do, and so that worked well. Um, this is this was my first experience terminating a flag when they didn't want to leave and you know buying something unencumbered. And in this particular deal, there was a, a preset formula and a fee on how to calculate the the termination fee, essentially the liquidated damages. And um, at the end of the day, we had to pay it. and we we pursued a different strategy um, at first, which was to try to negotiate a deal with the seller and for for us as the buyer and the seller to approach the brand together and try to negotiate something. Um, and there are the, the way that the, these contracts are structured, there's a little bit of leverage you, you could probably get over the brand in figuring out how to do that. In this case, it ultimately didn't work for us. And, and part of it was the seller wasn't interested in the potential exposure or just really that the headache. They just didn't want to deal. They just wanted a clean transaction, pay the money. You said you were going to take care of the fee. It's on you. I don't care about any of the extra money. Let's just move, move on. And so um, that was that was what we did here. It's it, you know We planned to do that from the get-go. So the capital stack was built with that in mind. You know Would we have loved to get some of the savings had we been able to pull that off? Of course. Um, but you know, it's something I think a lot about now and, and especially looking at new deals, getting into that diligence and reading through the franchise agreement, the management agreement, and um, really going deep on some of the details you might not otherwise be that interested in to figure out, you know, where can you poke a hole in it and, and try to have some opportunity um, if that's what you're looking to do ultimately. We've talked a little bit offline, but one of the things I admire about you is how you're doing these fabulous deals across different asset types, but you run such an entrepreneurial kind of corporate model. And it really seems to me that you've also figured out how to unlock the power of partnerships and leveraging your partner's knowledge and experience, clearly having good relationships because you've had repeats. So I'd love it if you could unpack kind of how you run your business at Kupperman Companies and then use that as a way to talk a little bit about how you found to work with partners to grow your business in a way that you might not be able to do just with your own team. Yeah, you know, one of the things as I have tried to throughout my career, really anything, but absorb as much information from people like you, Jake, who are building stuff, who are, you you know, you're your organization is bigger, your head, and just trying to learn as much is, you know, one of the things I have have tried to make sure in designing the way my company operates is the cyclical nature of real estate, knowing that in a development shop, I've never wanted to be in a spot where I need to do a deal to feed the beast and just mm -hmm. manufacture fees to keep the lights on and paying paying a team. And the idea to me that people will, you know, like the, the team is everything. And the idea that you will put so much 
effort into finding the right people and paying them and keeping them only to fire a bunch of people when the market turns and you don't like that's insanity to me. And I've always intentionally had that in the back of my mind, knowing, you know, most of my 12 or so years that I've, I've been doing real estate, really six since, since I started full speed have been in a good market. And so I haven't had a, a, a drastic downturn yet, but the idea that, um, you know, building something that can, that is, that is scrappy, that can survive during lean years. And that, you know, I would personally rather work myself to death that that might sound insane. And that's, that's where I've been. I've gotten to a place where we've, we've built enough of an organization to not have to do that as much. But in the beginning, you know, literally I'm doing everything from the bookkeeping to literally oven to the sun with, you know, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to overdo myself. I'll keep all the money, but I not have to do that. You know, that has its limits. And yep. now we've grown, you know, the, the team is five people, kind of five and a half people now. Uh, but still, it's a pretty lean team for the the volume of deals we're doing, and and um, you know part part of the the most of that has been intentional, and you know we don't have a management a property management arm. Part of that's intentional, you know, for this reason. Also, I mentioned before, I don't I don't love the operational side of it, but you know, so a lot of the design of of our organization has been with that in mind. You know, when times are good, they're they're booming, but even when times are bad. I don't need to rely on either selling assets or generating fees to keep the lights on. And it's worked out really well. And, and we've been able to get to a scale now where I don't have to kill myself every day. Good. Um, we're still, yeah, we're still, we're still only five people, but it's, it's worked really, really well so far. And um, on the uh, lucky community side, which is our, our mobile home park platform that I have with uh, a partner named Alex Ramirez, We've got 12 people there on that side, and that's only mobile home parks, you know, buying, and we do have a management component to that. So with those five people, with lucky communities, how do you organize your week? You've got operating properties, you got some properties in development, and you've got this team of five people. So how do you what are your tips and techniques for staying on top of everything and keeping the pulse? I mean, originally it was necessity, but now there's clearly a lot of strategy in there as well. I'd say at a, at a high level, I'm probably spending half my time on existing deals, primarily stable assets, but but some development deals, maybe 25% or so on operational, you know, team building and management side of stuff. And then 25% looking at new deals. That's the most fun. Can't do that all day, every day, but it's the most um, fun. I like it. Yeah, it's most fun. And so I, I, you know, will always be looking at opportunities and, and thinking about those. Um, our team, you know, of, of the five, um, myself, we've got a, a head of development, a project manager, and then uh, an accountant, an underwriter, and an operations person. And those last three are, are all in the Philippines. And so they've been integral, an integral part of the team. Um, I've had them for a year and a half, a uh, year and a half, a year and nine months. And so it's, it's worked incredibly well. And it's allowed me to scale, you know, quicker than, than I otherwise could, would have been comfortable with. Um, and on the lucky community side, kind of the same thing. We've got a team of 12, three here. Um, we've got two in India and I think eight now, um, seven now in, in the Philippines as well. And um, I've, I've worked with a, a firm called Shepherd. We've, we've talked about it. I did it too. Firm. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable and been a really great experience so far. How do you train an underwriter? Because this is something I'm going to do. I'm going to take your cue. I'm not going to hire your underwriter away. But how do you train an underwriter in the Philippines? Yeah, it's it's there's a lot of work that has to go into it. And in, in our case, uh, Gladys is is our is our uh, senior underwriter's name who lives in the Philippines. She had previously worked for a company in the UK, uh, doing primarily kind of triple net deals. 
And so she had a really good base. And, and in a lot of ways, I was lucky. She had the core competency. She's incredibly smart woman who has been in real estate, even in the Philippines, she was in real estate. So she had a core knowledge base to start from. And she understood, you know, what a waterfall was and, you know, the basics of all that kind of stuff. And then there was a lot of time going over models. And the way I found that the best way to do it is just through the ac- the academic exercise of looking at deals and doing, you know, hey, check this one out. What do you think of this? Hear what I think the assumptions would be. Come back, you know, put a model together and going through that a zillion times and, um, you know, not just in the academic setting, but then executing and closing, that's gone a, a tremendous, a tremendous way. And we've also invested in, we've got a, a program that's where we'll pay for ongoing education. And, you know, she's done some amazing uh, courses and some continued education on like really deep dives into waterfall modeling yep. and and Excel certifications and stuff like that. So part of that is is her own personal knowledge base. And, and part of it is, you know, getting getting the team used to how we do things culture wise with our how we look at underwriting and stuff like that. It's so important for emerging real estate firms, you know, mid-sized real estate firms. I'm in the same boat as you that I do not want to feel this immense pressure to just turn fees and turn deals. Obviously, I want to make my team a lot of money, but I have friends that run private equity firms with a few hundred million dollars in a fund and they're still not at break even because the cost is so big. And there's always other ways to do things in a more entrepreneurial way to allow you to hit above your weight, to allow you to get into, you know, Aspen, Hotel St. Vincent, doing what is essentially an institutional deal on the Homewood Suites. It's, It's amazing, man. You're impressive. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Just, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun and I, I feel really lucky that, um, you know, we, we've gotten to where we are. And when when Dinner Lab closed um, and I had to, you know, that was, you know, an inflection point about what am I doing with my life and, you know, practicing law, you're making this income and then you're doing a startup and you're this income and then the startup fails and you're zero income. And by the way, I had a kid and I'm about to have another kid and the, the expenses keep going. And, you know, it was a pretty tough, I, I mean, I, I knew in my heart, I did not want to go back to practice law or get a, a traditional job, but to to do it and to take the leap and, and you know, is another I give credit to my wife where it was kind of like, oh, hey, I, I don't, I got these offers in hand, but I really don't want to do this. I want to go start a real estate company. It's going to take years to make any money. What do you think? And she's like, I believe in you, you know, whatever you think, you know, I'm on board to kind of do it. So that was, that was, you know, obviously uh, helpful to go, go through that and, and um, to be on the same page there. But, you know, a lot, a lot has been, you know, the idea of being able to control your own destiny and have the flexibility to live the life you want design you know life design goes a long a long way and that was the the ultimate goal when i decided to do this back in 2016 and it's it's you know worked out well i mean it's it's on, on the one hand that sounds great on the other hand it's almost unlimited work so you could work all day all night and it's you and a small team doing everything so there is a lot of work luckily i i'm um geared toward working a lot uh, so far. So it's, it's worked out. Okay. I'm excited to continue to see you grow and crush it. And on your next cost overrun on Aspen, call me. Cause I want to invest in that deal. I'll pay for it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So I ask all my guests, this traditional closing question, and that is what is your favorite hotel? Great question. Um, of my own, St. Vincent's by far and away. Um, no hotels that you've been to, but, but but yeah, that but that that I've been to. Um, that's a great question. I think the latest I I love um, the Little Nell in in Aspen is is pretty unbelievable. Um, and it's you're you're right there at the base of the mountain. There's a lot of history there. It's an unbelievable hotel. 
And then I have to say, you know, the, the two, I kind of mentioned them earlier, they're competitors of mine, uh, but but in New Orleans, Hotel Chloe and Peter and Paul, love both of those hotels, try to go often as a patron, primarily at the, the restaurants, um, but they're, they're both incredibly detailed. They were done with a lot of eye towards detail, great experience, great vibe, and um, both of those are, are standouts. You said it all. Thanks for coming on Masters of Moments. Thank you, Jake. Really appreciate you having me. Hey, everyone. It's Jake here. Thanks again for joining me on this conversation. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Lastly, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Jay Warzak. I'll see you in the next episode. Jake Warzak is the founder and CEO of Dove Hill Capital Management. All opinions expressed by Jake and his guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Dove Hill Capital Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and does not reflect or represent real estate, financial, or investment advice. Mm-hmm.